Who is the goat? The greatest of all time. Jesus, you're right about that. And so uh, we like to argue about who is the greatest. In basketball, there's Michael Jordan and LeBron James. Uh, some of you may throw some other players in there. Wilt versus Kareem versus Shaq versus um, lots of other centers who have played the game. Soccer, it's uh, Messi versus Ronaldo. When I was growing up, it was Pele. Um, now Mbappe in there too. Baseball, you got Willie Mays versus Babe Ruth. And for those of you who are baseball fans, I don't watch baseball. So uh, that's about all, my extent of that knowledge. Golf, you got Jack Nicklaus versus Tiger Woods versus whoever's up and coming. Sumter athletes, you got Bobby Richardson versus Ray Allen versus Ja Morant versus Tim Simpson. And so... Um, <laughs> Uh, competitive eating, you got Joey Chestnut versus Kobayashi, right? And so I don't know if that's a sport, but I just thought it'd be fun to throw it in there. Uh, we want to establish a pecking order. We want to name someone at the top and we want someone to be at the bottom, right? Listen to what Richard Foster says in his book, Celebration of Discipline. When Jesus gathered his disciples for the Last Supper, they were, get, they were having trouble deciding who was the greatest. This was no new issue for them, and an argument arose among them as to which of them was the greatest, Luke 9, 46. Whenever there is trouble over who is the greatest, there is trouble over who is the least. That is the crux of the matter for us, isn't it? Most of us know we will never be the greatest just don't let us be the least. And then Jesus took up a towel and a basin and he redefined greatness. Richard Foster goes on to say, as the cross is the sign of submission, so the towel is the sign of service. Man, don't you read some authors and you're like, I wish I could write like that. So last week we talked about these things about churches that are, uh, have heavy gospel doctrine, but no gospel culture, which leads to hypocrisy. We talked about churches that are heavy on gospel culture, but lack gospel doctrine, and that leads to instability. That leads to uh, self, uh, self-help, behavioral modification, right? But when you put gospel doctrine and gospel culture together, there is power, and it puts the gospel fully on display for the, the dying world that needs to see it, Right? So this morning, we're going to look at building gospel culture in a healthy church. We started this series two weeks ago. We're going to spend some time thinking about what is a healthy church. What sets a healthy church apart from an unhealthy one? Let me just restate some things. Mark Dever in his book, What is a Healthy Church? says, A healthy church is a church in which every member, young and old, mature and immature, unites around the wonderful good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. And we spent a whole Sunday last Sunday talking about that. An essential mark of a healthy church is a biblical understanding of the gospel. And we went through Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. And it's beautiful, beautiful display of the gospel. There's so many passages you could use, but that's the one we chose. Okay? If you have a Bible this morning... I'd like you to turn to Ephesians 4. We're going to be in two different gospel passages uh, this morning. But turn to Ephesians 4. When you get there, if you'd say word, that'll let us know that you found the right book in the chapter. We believe this is the word of God. That's why we say word. This morning, I'd like us to look at Ephesians 4 and think about equipping and serving. Uh, when I was telling Shelly that uh, this was going to be the, the lesson for today, uh, she said, your sermon, she didn't know the full extent of my sermon yet, but she had a good idea where it was going. And the children's lesson today line up perfectly. And so if I would have known that big idea, I would have just used it as mine so I could steal somebody else's words. And so uh, um, listen to what, uh, they call this the Christ connection. If your children attend our, our Sunday school classes, they call this the Christ connection. So listen to how they phrased it. I think it's actually better than what I said, but here we go. We can serve others so people all over the world can hear and believe the good news about Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? You often wonder, like, are they just doing child care over there? No, 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 no. <laughs> They're talking about gospel transformation. And um, 
We can serve others so people all over the world can hear and believe the good news about Jesus. That's why we serve, right? We don't serve just for our benefit, for the church's benefit. So this was my big idea. A healthy church equips the members for the work of the ministry and building up the body of Christ. You're going to see I stole that right from Paul in Ephesians 4, but just give me a minute. A healthy church equips the members for the work of the ministry and building up the body of Christ. So that's what we want to do as we talk about what is a healthy church. Let me see. uh, we, We talked about this definition of a church a few weeks ago. If you weren't here, the church is a gathering and body of people who have been forgiven of their sin and have been reconciled to God the Father through Jesus, through faith in Jesus Christ. They share a common confession, Jesus is Lord. Uh, We share a common confession around that, that Jesus is Lord, Jesus is King, I am not. Jesus is King, you are not. So we submit to him. And so last week, it kind of flowed right into this week, Ephesians 2, we made a, a, a teaching point which says, God didn't save us because of our good works, but he did save us so he could do a good work in us and through us. So God did this because he wants to do something in us and through it, not because we are good, but for our good and the good of others, which is exactly what the children's um, Christ connection said. So Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitfulness and deceitful schemes. Rather, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. It's a beautiful passage. So church leaders, people in leadership of the church, prepare, they train, they equip God's people for ministry. So as Christians, we all have a work of ministry because we are all have spiritual gifts given by Christ. So let me tell you how we put it on your teaching sheet. The, the church is to have an every member ministry. The church is to have an every member ministry. So that means every church member has a gift that has been given by God. And we want to use those uh, to bless others. We want to use that for the building up of the church. So verse 13 goes on to say that the diversity of gifts, though, serves to bring about the unity of Christ's people. Each spiritual gift that God has given to Christians is meant to bring unity, not division. Unity, not comparison. Unity, not arrogance. But how many times in churches have we seen that some gifts are exalted above the others? But the Bible is clear in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 that it's about the unity of Christ's people. That it's to create unity, not division. It's it's not to say your gift is, is lesser than. Uh, 1 Corinthians is going to talk about this in just a minute, but I just wanted to take a second to go. Every member has a gift. Every Christian has a gift, and we need to use those for the unity of the church. So Ephesians 4, 13 through 14. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith, that's what we're striving toward, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So so when the saints are equipped, they mature in their relationship with Christ. They grow in their knowledge of Jesus, the Son of God. So year after year, we should be growing in our knowledge of Jesus. Our Bible reading should strengthen our knowledge. We don't wanna stay children in our faith. We, we don't want to be tossed to and fro by bad doctrine. Uh, 
you guys already know this, but there's, there's plenty of false teachers online and on TV and on the radio. You and I need to be growing in our knowledge of Jesus and his word so that we can spot the fakes, we can spot the imposters, we can spot the counterfeits. When you hear somebody on, online saying something that doesn't align with the Bible, there should be a rub. <laughs> there should be a sense that, hey, that's not right. That doesn't line up with what scripture says. So don't be deceived by their human cunning you see, false teachers get to the elevated state that they are because they are crafty, right? What they are saying sounds good, but it is not based on the Bible. So if you have a particular uh, preacher that you're listening to and he's like, uh, if you follow Jesus, you will never be sick again. Well, then you should look at the Bible and go, well, Paul was in the wrong then. He must have not been following Jesus. If you follow Jesus, you will never, uh, you, you'll always be rich. Well, then look to Jesus himself who did not have a home. And if Jesus wasn't doing it right, then no one's doing it right. Let me be honest with you, okay? So you and I need to be able to spot these false teachers and not be tossed to and fro by bad doctrine. Let me just say it like this. Some of us have been listening to somebody for so long that we can't think to ourselves, is that actually biblical? If you'd like to have a more in-depth conversation in this, and you're like, Tim, I listen to this person often, and I, I, I would just like to, to help you, shepherd you through some of the, what you're listening to, because there's a lot of bad teaching, and now that we are online, it is like endless the shorts, the streams, the TikTok, all of the above. You can just find bad teaching after bad teaching. And it sounds good, but it is not biblical. Ephesians 4.15 says, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So every member should grow up and use a towel, not wear a bib. We should not be immature consumers, but eager servants. I think that was Richard Foster. I, I just kind of combined a bunch of his thoughts into, into one. But I love the way he put that, that every member should grow up and use a towel. And that's what Ephesians 4 is talking about, about growing up. That we want to mature in our faith. We don't want to be immature consumers, but eager servants. So notice that verse 15 says, speaking the truth in love. And verse 16 concludes with makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. There, it's wrapped in love. This is why we are serving. This is why we are equipping. We are being equipped so we can love each other better. We are being equipped so we can serve each other selflessly. The basin and the towel is about love and being willing to be the least for the glory of God. And that's where the rub was in the room when the disciples were like, who's going to wash the feet? <laughs> and then when Jesus picked up the basin and the towel, they thought, oh, we have made a tragic error. Jesus was saying, I'll be the least. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 Corinthians 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our, 
unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our most, our more presentable parts do not require. So God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Let me try to summarize some of these verses. Verse 12, a church has many members and they comprise one body, the body of Christ, right? So we're making up into one body, but we all have many members. Verses 15 through 21, it's a lot of verses in there, but the body needs all of its parts for it to work. Um, uh, this, is, uh, this ties into what I was saying earlier. Uh, I was in Myrtle Beach yesterday, but I spent the day at the soccer park. I didn't ever saw the beach, right? Um, when I was in college, I worked at Burger King, to which you go, uh, in Honolulu, Hawaii. And so, uh, um, so I was in Honolulu, Hawaii on a summer project with Campus Crusade for Christ. It's called Crew Now for all you young people. That's what it's called for all you people like me. It was called Campus Crusade for Christ. So I was there. And during uh, that summer, these guys did a skit where they were talking about the parts of the body. And they did a skit where one of them was the eye, one was the ear, one was the hand. And, uh, and the, they, they put on uh, these different costumes and just had these little, actually, they just had name tags across them. They just said the hand. It was very elaborate, right? And so um, we were in Hawaii, but we were poor. We were all college students. And so um, the skit goes on. And so the eye was just like, you don't need me. And so he walks away and then all the parts pulled out sunglasses and we're like, where's the eye, right? And I never forgot that. I can't even remember the guy who wrote it. I think his name was Mike, but I remember thinking that skit has stuck in my mind all these years. And actually that line that I just read, the body needs all of its parts for it to work is from the summer of 1992 in Honolulu, Hawaii, where God had pulled me away from my struggling with sin at the University of Alabama. And he took me to Honolulu, Hawaii, and he showed me what discipleship looked like and what holiness looked like. And he started to give me a bigger glimpse of what the church should look like and that it needs all of its parts for it to work. If you can picture this, I had a mullet at this time. <laughs> I was a lot less big than I am now. Okay, I'll just put it that way. But God was doing a work in my heart and I would look at the other guys that were with me and I was like, man, I wish I looked like you. You look like a man. Uh, I look like Andre Agassi had a, like a, a very tall child. And so, um, but I was learning about what the body needed and that it needed all of its parts for it to work. And it was that summer where I felt a call to full-time Christian ministry. I had no idea what that was gonna look like. But I thought, God, if you could use a mullet uh, wearing guy from Alabama to, to speak to the hearts of people, then and, and I'm, uh, here I am, send me. Just kind of put my yes on the table and, and he did the work. Has your foot ever fallen asleep? It's an awful feeling, right? What if one day your foot revolted and said, I don't want to be a part of your body anymore, right? Uh, some of us not all of us, but we have to get up in the middle of the night and go to the restroom. And, uh, and oftentimes my eyes aren't working, but my feet work very well. And uh, if they find my bedpost, oh, they communicate clearly to my brain what's going on, right? So, so these parts are all very necessary. And I think Paul did a great job of just aligning it out. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Yes, you do. So the parts we consider to be weaker and less honorable are vital. So for all of us in the, in the body of Christ, if, we, if you're a Christian in this room today, you have a role in the local church. You might think that you are weaker, but Paul is saying over and over again that you are not dispensable, you are indispensable. So the parts that we consider to be weaker and less honorable are vital. As, as Christians, we still struggle with sin and our thoughts are, are, are still in need of sanctification. We might think 
that you are more special than someone else in the church because of where you serve, we can all be very judgmental, right? But I, I'm not sure, I, I'm not sure what Paul meant when he wrote the less honorable parts, but I, I remember reading the Bible with some guys a few years ago, and one of them said, we are all but dust. <laughs> but he said it, we are all but dust, okay? And so uh, I, I think some parts are less honorable, right? But we're, we're all coming from the same thing. We were on a mission trip in Mexico in the early 2000s. Um, Shelly and I are, are newly married at this time. We took 100 students uh, to the border of Mexico. Uh, probably not the best idea, but the trip had just kind of built over the, 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 the few years that we did it. Um, there were other college pastors, and I had given these college students roles in leadership because we wanted to train them. We're like, we're going to take you to Mexico, but you're going to do the work, and we're going to be there as kind of safety nets. Well, Shelly and I were on separate teams, um, and so she was at this one team, and her, uh, her leader had asked her to make Kool-Aid. So mind you, Shelly at this point is probably 26 years old. Uh, she'd been doing ministry longer than this boy had been changing his own underwear. And so, uh, so this boy says, do you know how to make Kool-Aid? <laughs> And Shelly was like, I think I got this. And he was like, do you really? And she was like, I'm pretty sure. So I think about that story when I think about the less honorable parts. It was probably better that I was not on her team at that point. But Shelly will often remind me of that story. And she was like, sometimes people just say some of the craziest things. Do you know how to make Kool-Aid? Yes, I do. But when we are serving, humility is required. Let's just be honest. People are going to say some crazy things. Like you could be holding a screaming child in our children's ministry and somebody come up to you and go, how's the weather? And you're like, obviously things are not well, okay? Uh, so we, we want to have humility when we are serving. And I think that's what verse 24 is saying, which our more presentable parts do not require, but God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. So verses 24 and 25, God gives honor to all the parts so there will be no division in the church. All the members require care. All of us could use someone to come alongside of us and check on us. And that's what verse 26 says. If you suffer, we suffer. If you are honored, then we are happy for you. Have you had those brothers and sisters where something hard is going on in your life and they just kind of come alongside of you and go, I'm with you. There's some other moments where things are going really well and somebody comes alongside and just says, I'm with you. Congratulations, this is awesome, right? So what's your next step? How, how do we apply Ephesians 4 and 1 Corinthians 12? A healthy church equips the members for the work of the ministry and a building up of the body of Christ. A, a question that I want you to think about that, that'll help you start thinking about this. What are you doing with what God has given you? What are you doing with what God has given you? Let me read you a made up story about a lady named Ginger, okay? There's no gingers in our church. That's why I chose this name, okay? Okay. We got some redheaded people, but they're named in Ginger. Okay. Ginger is a member of a local church. She told me one day, I'm struggling to know what my role is in the church. Ginger didn't lead a ministry. She wasn't responsible for any programs or events. Ginger thought she wasn't serving the church. Yet Ginger faithfully shows up every Sunday. She comes early and stays late so that she has plenty of time to talk to others. She's always at members' meetings so that she can vote on important issues and ask meaningful questions. She serves in the nursery and regularly invites church members to her home. She encourages the members with scripture. She prays for them. She talks to visitors. In so many ways, Ginger serves her church faithfully and meaningfully. She's vital despite not having an official title or formal ministry position. Let me tell you about some other people. When Becky had a baby, 
Alyssa organized a meal schedule for Becky's family, even though she doesn't have a formal position at the church. John and Beulah regularly have young professionals over for dinner and take members of our youth group to lunch on Sunday afternoons. Mark and Nancy host a Bible study in their living room on Thursday evening. Stuart goes out of his way every Sunday to make visitors feel welcome. Barbara keeps tabs on some of our older members and often drives them to doctor's appointments. Billy fills the water dispenser and makes the coffee on the first Sunday morning of every month, even though no one has ever asked him to. Brittany practices hospitality, regularly inviting church members into her home. And I can insert real names in all of those stories in our church. We have people that are serving the local church right here and they're doing it because they are part of the family of God. They simply recognize they're, they're part of a family, so they act like members of a family. My brother-in-law has endeared himself to my mom in many ways, but one of the ways he's endeared himself to her is when she cooks, he cleans up. And I think it's sometimes because he doesn't want to talk to anybody else, okay? <laughs> And so you, you can find some solace in the dishwater, right? <laughs> Just a word of wisdom. And so I, I learned from him. I was like, I see your strategy. You're tired of dealing with the crazy around the table. Just kidding. Uh, it's my family, so I guess I can say that, right? And so he would often go over there and serve, but I, it's because he's part of our family. He's not doing it because he's paid to. And so, so my boys have even noticed this. My sons, they've been like, where's Uncle John going? I was going, he's going where we should all be going. Because you see the way Nana looks at Uncle John? That's the way you want her to look at you. <laughs> you want to earn her love. Just kidding. And so uh, 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 there's, some, there's some people who cook often in the room, and, and we need to be mindful of that, right? So here's some meaningful ways for you to serve the church. I'm not going to list every way, but I'm going to give you some. Number one, Christians assemble, Okay. Avengers Assemble, I know it's cheesy, but it'll stick in your head. We stir each other up to love and encourage each other by gathering. We, we gather on Sundays. Why do we gather on Sundays? Because really it's commanded in the Bible, Hebrews 10. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Isn't that beautiful? It's, it's right there in scripture that we're, we're not going to neglect to meet together. This is why the pandemic was really hard, right? I was so thankful when I, I came here in July of 2020 to be the pastor that we were gathering on the front lawn. God gave us a property to use, right? And so we want to gather together. Christians need to assemble when we gather on Sundays, we're testifying to one another that Christ is King that God's word is true and that his church will prevail until Christ comes again. And really, you're saying that to your neighbors. It's like, why is so-and-so getting dressed in, in, in any kind of respectable clothes and going to church? We want to proclaim to the world that Christ is king. Number two, we want to equip and disciple others. Equip and disciple others. Discipleship happens when we are willing to give and receive instruction from other believers. I think that's a beautiful definition of discipleship. I think I got it from uh, this little book. By the way, uh, there's a little book out there called How Can I Serve My Church? It's by a guy named Matthew Amadi. Uh, when you walk out those doors on Sunday mornings, there are a bunch of little booklets out there and they're all in a row. Those are free. We don't say that enough, but, but those are to equip you. Those are to give you a beginning resource on one of those questions. And if you start pulling them, we'll start putting more, okay? That's how that works. If, I, I constantly walk past there during the week and I'm looking at the ones that you guys are pulling. But some of you are probably scared to touch them because you thought they might come with a cost. The books around the corner come with a cost, right? There are a couple of free on the shelf, but those books are free. And there's a little one called, uh, How Can I Serve My Church? And this is what he says in that 
book. Speaking the truth in love is how we disciple one another. What a simple way of saying that. We want to build a culture of discipleship and evangelism at Cross Point. We want to equip and train our members to share their faith and make disciples who make disciples. We, we, need to, we need men to pour their lives into the lives of other men. We need women to pour their lives into the lives of other women. You don't have to be that far ahead of, of someone in your walk with the Lord. You can, you can guide them and disciple them. Titus 2 is a biblical, healthy model for discipleship. If you'd like to talk more about that, I would love to talk to more about that. Come tonight, we will talk more about that. Number three, listen and respond to needs. Listen and respond to needs. One of the most important parts of being in a small group, a Sunday school class, is the prayer request time. And you don't have to do it every Sunday, and it doesn't have to go on for 45 minutes. But it's a time for someone in your class to look around the room and go, I, I need you to pray for me. I need you to come alongside of me and pray into God in this situation. The beautiful part of, of, of you guys coming early and staying late and getting to know each other is that you actually get to know the real you and that everything's not always hunky-dory. After church, I'd rather have a 10-minute conversation with somebody about something that's actually personal than a 10-minute conversation that's fleeting in the news headlines, Right? So you and I need to, to listen and respond to needs. That's how we can serve the church. Number four goes in lines with this. We want to be hospitable. We want to visit and host. We want to practice hospitality, which is costly. It will affect your budget. It will eat up your schedule. It will expend your physical and emotional energy. Let's just put it all out there Everyone is busy. Shelly and I, pet peeve. And somebody's like, I know you're so busy, but I'm like, everyone is busy. Everyone. Everyone is busy doing what they do, but that does not preclude us from being hospitable. That does not preclude us from visiting and hosting. Let me just give you a litany of Bible verses on this. This is just three, actually. Romans 12, 13 says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. I don't know how that happens, okay? But I'm telling you, that's, that's in the Bible. 1 Peter 4, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's a big one, right? I'll just be honest with you. There's people that come to our house sometimes and I'm, I'm grumbling and Shelly's like, get it together. Aren't you the pastor? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I am, I am. But the fact that I got to go around and pick up empty cups all over my house is starting to irritate me when I've drank out of none of those cups. I have a turvis tumbler and it's mine, okay? So, but the Bible though tells me what I don't really want to hear. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Number five, encourage others. Encourage others. That's a, that's a way for us to serve in the local church. Have you ever been lonely? Our lives are, are full of discouragement and adversity. Satan desperately wants to snuff out our faith and make us entirely ineffective for kingdom work. We, we so often feel alone and isolated. And fellas, I'm talking to you. So many men live these isolated lives. Let me give you a Bible verse that I was actually unaware of. Uh, I didn't have it in my sermon until this morning. I was listening to a podcast on the way to church that was just playing in my car because Spotify hooked up. I was not trying to listen one, okay? 
Listen to what this beautiful verse is to say. 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 6. It's not on the screen. Here's a Bible verse, okay? For even when we came into Macedonia, Paul's writing this, our bodies had no rest. Anybody with me? Those of you with young kids in your house, those of you caring for your parents, our bodies had no rest, but we were afflicted at every turn, fighting without and fear within. But God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 6. Paul is saying that we were beat down, that we were, we were afflicted at every turn. We were fighting without and we were fear within, but God who comforts the downcast sent Titus. Don't you want to be like that? Don't you want to be a Titus in someone's life? Well, I'll just tell you that, that there's so many people in our church and in Sumter who could use someone to come alongside of them and just give them a listening ear and encouragement. I think our society has never been lonelier. And we will not know the full effects of the pandemic for many, many years. And I had kids in multiple grades during the pandemic. And I don't know what that's going to do long term. But what I do know is the Bible holds to be true. And that I could be a, I could be a Titus to, to a man. You could, you could be a Titus to a woman. So the question is, what, what if no one ever notices what I'm doing for the church body? Let me tell you how Richard Foster puts it in Celebration of Discipline. He says, true service, rest, contented in hiddenness. True service, rest, contented in hiddenness. Listen to how he goes on to explain this. Nothing disciplines the inordinate desires of the flesh like service. Nothing transforms the desires of the flesh like serving in hiddenness. The flesh whines against service, but screams against hidden service. It strains and pulls for honor and recognition. Every time we crucify the flesh, we crucify our pride and arrogance. Man, that's good. I've been listening to this song called Happily Hidden. It's by Pat Barrett. Um, he wrote Good, Good Father, if you're a fan of that song. Uh, he and a guy named John Mark McMillan uh, sing this song on Pat's new album. It's actually, his album's called Happily Hidden. I know people don't listen to albums anymore, but I do because I'm old. And uh, so I kind of listen to the whole thing sometimes. I don't just pick and choose a song that I think one artist has. Um, sometimes I do. But every once in a while, I just find a whole album He's got this song called Happily Hidden, and I, I just wanted to read the lyrics for you today um, because God's been using them in my, in my heart the past few weeks when I'm thinking about equipping and serving. We beg for attention, someone to see who we really are, caught in the system, using each other to get what we want. The lust for approval Using the spotlight just like a drug makes you feel noticed and valued, forgotten and used, the counterfeit to love. We're like little commercials trying to sell everyone ourselves, like marketing billboards trying to catch every eye that we can. We can you can feel the imposter wanting to be the one who's seen. Are we feeding a monster and still wondering why we're not free. And this is the course. Let him be your hiding place. Let him be your joy. Let him be your audience. Let him be it all. Happily hidden. Oh, happily with him. Will you pray with me? 
Father, when we talk about equipping and serving, some of us just, we go through our to-do list and we just feel burdened. But Jesus, you modeled a, a strength that we don't pull from sometimes and that's your strength. In the busiest of seasons, Jesus, you seem to pull away and spend time with your father so that you would have strength to go on. And Jesus, we know that you are the son of God. And so when we look to you and we see that model, we need to think to ourselves, how do I need to live my life? Do I need to live my life thirsting for other people's approval and so that I could be seen and so I could be liked, so I could just be clicked, so I can get as many hearts as I want to? Or, Jesus, are you calling us to, uh, to be happily hidden with you? To seeing you as our audience, to finding our joy in you, to finding our strength in you? Or do we want to happily serve other people. And we're asking today, Jesus, for a supernatural strength to do so. Because if we had to be honest, we feel like there's a fight without and a fear within. There's a loneliness that abides in our hearts, Lord, and I pray that we could submit those things to you in your word. And I pray that we would find ourselves today hidden in you, comforted by you. Father, would you help us to be willing to show up for people, to serve them, to lay our lives down just as you laid your life down for us. Jesus, thank you for all that you're doing in us and through us. May you continue to speak to our heart May you use your word to convict us and shine your light on us and encourage us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.